My name is Alan Menezes and I'm the director of the Pilates Institute of Australasia. With over 30 years experience in teaching Pilates, especially in the rehab area, I've actually developed my own style of Pilates, which we've now called Menezes Method or Menezes Pilates. It's substantially different insofar as breathing technique goes, as far as abdominal connection goes, and as far as some of the muscle work goes as well. Coming from an athletic background and not a balletic background, we're actually making the exercises more suitable for everyone who wants to become the athlete within them. It works you harder, it gives you much more core control, and it actually makes you feel a lot better. We've got a new series of DVDs out, ranging from pregnancy, low back pain, floor, and a few others. And we hope you really enjoy viewing them. We're now going to go over the principles of the Menezes Pilates method and as to why it's so different to the rest of Pilates. First of all, we're going to start with the feet. The posture starts from your feet. Anything that happens through the rest of your spine, through walking or standing, actually comes from the way your feet are placed. So we're going to talk about tripods first. So Kara, if you'd just like to stand over here on the floor. Whenever you're working with your tripods, never stand on a carpeted area, a thick carpet or a mat because they've got a bit of give in them. When you're standing, you need to stand on three points of your feet that we call tripods. Point number one is the ball of the big toe. Point number two is the entire outside edge of the foot. And point number three is the center of the heel. So what you need to do here is stand with even pressure on all three points. When you're not standing with even pressure, just stand as you normally would without the pressure. And you'll notice to a certain extent that even though kara has got really good arches here, slightly, slightly, slightly dropped. So when you stand on the tripods, you'll notice that the arches will increase. If you don't stand on the arches, they will pronate or drop on the arch. So we want to keep those arches pronated without gripping the toes so the toes are relaxed. The next thing we're going to come to are the knees. A lot of people do stand with hyperextended knees, so the knees actually sway back. Whenever you're standing around, always bend the knees very slightly, and you'll immediately notice you're starting to work your legs. So if we turn sideways for a second, okay, let's get the tripods engaged and just lock your knees back, okay? And you'll notice there's a sway back there. And you'll notice also that there was also a corresponding sway back in the back here, but we'll come to that in a minute. Now, bend the knees very slightly, okay? And you'll find that you're actually going to start working those muscles. So you need to have the tripods engaged and the knees slightly bent. Turning around to the front again, we're going to work on the abdominals. We work on two areas of the abdominals what we call the B-line and the core. Now, in most Pilates, they say navel to spine, or in most exercise programs, they'll say navel to spine. If you draw a line from your navel to your spine, from here all the way back here, you've got five lumbar vertebrae. And that navel to spine will hit around about the L2 or L3 lumbar vertebrae. Most people's back problems are L4, L5, S1. So if you keep consistently drawing in the navel to the spine, it's not going to actually support the lower back area. So quite a while ago, we created a thing called the B-line. So the B-line is to draw a line from this hip bone here, actually otherwise known as an ASIS, your anterior superior iliac spine. Draw a line from this hip bone across to this hip bone here. And if you come back to the center of that line, you'll notice how the front of that is actually sticking slightly out of the line I just drew. So we're going to try and engage that without squeezing the backside, without tucking the pelvis, without leaning into the heels and without sticking the backside out, what I'm going to do is to get Kara to pull away from my fingers. So sucking in deeply from where that beeline is. And you notice that pulls in there. Can you notice that pulling in there? You're also going to feel a bit taller. Now what some people are going to feel is actually they might feel a bit of discomfort in their back. That's not because the back is arching. When you draw the beeline in, it actually lengthens up the spine. So that discomfort is actually just a little bit of lengthening of the spine if you do get it. So we also call this the B line because think of it as the bikini line for the girls and B for belt line for the guys. So pull your bikini line or belt line behind your hip bones. Now for many years, the B line has been used for over 20 years in fact, and navel to spine has been used a lot. So all of this is actually pulling front to back or anterior to posterior. That doesn't actually apply so much anymore now as a stable area to work with. It doesn't actively strengthen your core and more research is coming out to prove that. So a few years ago, we also developed our core. At the moment, everyone is talking about core stability and core stability becomes the buzzword in the industry. But when they talk about it, they still are going front to back, navel to spine, B line in fact. So we now only use the B line in forward flexion and lateral flexion of your torso. The rest of the time we use the core 
And this is the description of the core. What you'd like to think of here is the area between the ribs and the hips, which in fact is the definition of your center as per Joseph Pilates, the area between the ribs and the hips, front and back. We added in the sides. So what we're going to do here is start to strengthen your core from the sides, which in my mind is far, far more important than trying to strengthen it from the front. So the area between your ribs and your hips, what I'd like you to do here is use some imagination. Evacuate it so there's a big blank gap, and all I can see is your spine. You're going to replace that area with a large apple. Core the apple and throw the core out. So you've got an apple sitting there with a hollow down the center, and that hollow is in front of your spine. So, Kara, what I'd like you to do is place your hands underneath your rib cage. Okay? You're going to press with your thumbs because that's going to just keep the back arched because you want that arch in the back. Squeeze your sides in and then squeeze your fingers in from the front. Okay? So you're squeezing that hollow core till it disappears. Your B line is still engaged. This is part of that core. So, now, keep squeezing that hollow core till it's gone. And now, keep squeezing that core with your muscles and take your hands away. Can you feel your sides pulling in? Okay, and you'll even notice from before that the sides have actually come in a little bit here. So every time we mention squeeze the core in any of our programs, it means squeeze from the back, the sides, and the front, this area here. And if you feel these muscles on the sides working, that's exactly what you want. You want your obliques and your transverse abdominals from the sides pulling in. Because your transverse abdominals, the core muscles everyone's talking about, they're actually a cylinder-shaped muscle. They're not a flat muscle. So if you go front to back, anterior to posterior, the sides of them will flare out, and so you have no lateral support. So if you're turning to look down the driveway, reversing, you can actually cause some problems because there's no lateral support. So squeezing your core this way gives you that lateral support, but also elevates your spine. So it decompresses your spine, takes the pressure off your lower back. So the B-line and the core together work really well. Like I said, the B-line is used only for forward and lateral flexion of your torso. The core is used for everything else, including hyperextension. So when you're coming up out of a side flexion, so off you go to side flexion, that's your B-line there, and then squeeze your core to come up, and that elevates you and makes you grow taller. Okay? So the next thing we're going to work on here is the breathing. If you can turn around, all the way around. When breathing, we'd like you to think of this. Imagine someone's got their hands on your shoulder blades and breathe into the upper back. So when you're holding that B-line in, you're going to find if you try and take a breath in, you're going to feel like you're almost choking. <gasps> Not enough room, like I almost did then. So what you'd like to do here is imagine there are hands on your shoulder blades, keep the B-line in, squeeze the core, and breathe into the upper back. So if you can breathe up there into the upper back, and then ocean breath out. Now what do we mean by ocean breath out is all the air out of the lungs in, in, in probably a four count. So it's in through the nose for a four count, ocean breath out of the mouth for a four count. So take that breath in and ocean breath out. And you need to be able to hear this loud breathing consistently during your exercise program. Keep going. And the ocean breath out. That's what you want to hear. If you're not breathing loudly enough, you're not going to work that core effectively enough. Keep going. And ocean breath out. This time you're going to breathe into the upper back and the armpits. So imagine inflating balloons in the armpits. And notice the difference in the capacity here. You can see it from that view. The lungs actually open up a heap more. And ocean breath out. And last one. And relax. Okay, turn around and face the front again. Now, what we're going to do here is if you just keep your hands exactly where they are there, Kara. Kara's doing a perfect thing here that we've got to correct on her. If you notice the way her hands are facing, she's actually got her palms facing backwards. There's an animal that walks around like that. But anyway, we're going to work on this here. It's a postural thing. You notice if you take a comfortable, normal breath in and out, just a couple of comfortable breaths in and out, just normal. That's it. Now, if you notice, when the hands are facing like this here, the points of the elbows are actually facing way out here. So the points of the elbows are going way back there. Now, that's all controlled by this bone here called your humerus. So what I'd like you to do, Kara, is to turn the points of your elbows to face back. Okay, not totally back, so they're not going inwards. That's it there. Okay, and notice when this turns back here, this muscle here, your pectoral muscle, opens. Your muscles in the back here also come together, so it improves your posture in the back here. Okay, so just relax again, normal position. Okay, watch the shoulders, and again, turn the points of the elbows back, and that comes slightly back there, and that'll make a big difference. Now a couple of comfortable breaths in and out again. Okay, and I don't know if you can notice this, but there is an increase in the lung capacity, and it's more comfortable. 
Okay? Now, you're not going to walk around the street like this. So obviously, when you turn the points of the elbows back, just slightly back, and you'll notice the palms will probably face the body. Okay? Now, also, turning around again, what we want here is to try and stop the shoulders hunching a lot when you're doing exercising. So we've got this thing you call shoulder blades into the pocket. So I want you to imagine you're wearing a pair of jeans with a pocket in the center down here. And you're going to squeeze your shoulder blades into that pocket. So you're going to go down and back. Don't go back and down, because if you go back and down, relax for a second. If you go, so squeeze back, good, and now try and go down. Not great. You're going to crane your neck forward, you're going to arch your back more. So what you want to do is gently draw the shoulders down and then back. And you're going to squeeze them down in towards the tailbone area here. Okay, it's just a bit of a tuck there. That's it. Okay, so here's the pocket. So squeeze the shoulder blades into that pocket. And notice the posture up here is much, much more upright and better. Okay, so let's turn around. This time we're going to face sideways to the camera. Okay, just there. So what we've got here, Kara does have a bit more of an extension in an arch in her back here called a lordosis. It's a little bit more than normal, and people call it a hyperlordosis as well. So what we're going to do here with that arch in the back there, and you'll notice there's a little bit of that beeline coming out there. So if you draw the beeline in there, and notice what happens there. There's a little bit less of an arch there without leaning too far back. So your standing posture should actually be where your shoulder or at least your ear, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, and your heel are virtually in a straight line. So if you're craning your neck forward too much, you've got to bring the head back there. So whenever exercising as well, think of where your eyes are going or your nose is going. If your nose is down, you will round your shoulders. So just try that. And, feel the and, you'll, mm. and you'll notice the shoulders start to round. You feel a bit more compacted here. When you bring your nose up and the shoulder blades into the pocket, you open up much more, your breathing is better, your posture is a lot better, and keeping the beeline in. So we've got several things here to cover. We've got your tripods and your knees, bending the knees slightly, that's point number one. Your beeline and your core, that's point number two. Breathing into your armpits and your upper back, point number three. You're also going to lengthen through the crown of your head. So during all these exercises, one of the main principles here is also elongation. So lengthening through the crown. Lengthen through the crown of the head, shoulder blades down towards the pocket, which is the tailbone, tailbone towards the floor. And during the exercise, you'll see a lot of principles about elongation. Lengthening is not just through one point, it's through two opposite points. So if you're going to lengthen through your toes, make sure that the hip is also lengthening into the floor so it doesn't come off off the floor. Things like that. And you'll, you'll see these happening during parts of the exercise program. Okay, we're going to get down onto the floor now and go over some breathing techniques. What we're going to cover here is basically how to breathe correctly and how to make your breathing more comfortable when doing exercises lying on your back. The majority of exercises in Pilates are lying on your back, and therefore you've got to make this as comfortable as possible. So if you look at the posture here, you can see that if you just move your arm out of the way there, there's quite a bit of an arch in the back over here, okay? Quite a bit of an arch. In fact, I can put my hand all the way under. You can see my fingers on the other side, and that's a normal posture that Kyra would have gotten into. We'll come to that in a second, but let's talk about the breathing. Again, hands are by the sides. When you've got your hands by your sides on the floor, we need your palms up. Now, the reason for this is, if you have your palms down and you have an exercise with, say, for example, your legs are in the air and you start to struggle, you'll push your hands into the floor, so turn your palms down. And if you start pushing your hands into the floor, you'll notice that affects the neck area. Your neck might arch, you'll feel a strain in your shoulders. But if you turn your palms up and you push your elbows or hands into the ground, you're going to find that all you do is you'll stabilize the shoulder and work the tricep muscle over there. Can't be a bad thing. Okay, so it'll give you shoulder stability and also work your tricep and not strain your neck. So the first thing here is just again take a comfortable breath in and out. Okay, and just notice the lung capacity there. So now what I want you to do is lift your head, rest there, and again, a couple of comfortable breaths in and out. Notice immediately you can see the lungs are opening up. You can see the breathing moving here. And how does that feel on your neck? A lot more comfortable. Okay. So here what we're talking about is a lot of people do the exercises lying with their head right down on the ground. When you're curling forward with a lot of Pilates exercises which involve a contraction forward, otherwise a curl forward, you have to lift your, leg, your head off the ground. Where the head is now, which is that cushion there, to where it was before is what I call the dead zone. That area is called the dead zone. Because when you curl up, let me take that away for a second, okay? Now, just curl up, okay? And reaching the arms forward to mid-mind thigh level, so okay, don't come too far up. And go back down again, all the way to the floor, 
and back up again. Do half a dozen of these and all the way down. And you'll notice that you're going to start straining the neck eventually because you're actually going all the way down. Your abdominals don't engage, and they don't engage until your head comes to that level where the cushion was. The initial part of the movement is the strain of the neck. So if you now go from there, a bit more comfortable, mm -hmm. because you're not straining the neck through that small phase there, and you're connecting the abdominals earlier. OK, relax. So a cushion underneath the head or a rolled up towel. But if you're rolling up a towel, make sure it's not rolled up underneath your neck. You've got to have it underneath the back of your head. OK? So the next thing here is that arch. By having the cushion there, if you noticed, that arch is actually reduced a little bit, isn't it? Simply by having that there. Let me just go over this again. Rest your head back down. So watch the ribcage area here. Watch the arch in the back. This time, take a huge breath in. And notice how the back wants to arch a little bit more and relax. Notice that? OK, lift your head. Take the breath in again, huge breath in. Notice it's much more stable in the back. I don't know if you noticed that. Can you feel the difference? Yeah. OK. So cushion under the head is important for two points. The dead zone, so you don't get this whiplash effect on your neck, but also to keep your thoracic area more stable. Now, the other big thing in Pilates, again, palms up. The other big thing in Pilates as well at the moment is neutral spine. Everyone is using it. And I think they're actually using it incorrectly. When you've got this neutral spine, Yes, there are exercises where you need to have that like that. But if you have neutral spine in this position here with an arch in your back, and then you want to take your legs into the air, you're going to struggle. You're going to strain with your hip flexors, and you're also going to find you'll get some back pain, and you might not even work your abs effectively. So we've got a thing called stable spine where we do not use this arch at all. We do not use neutral spine. Pilates himself never used neutral spine either. Okay. People were saying, well, he didn't know the mechanics in those days, things like that. I think he actually did. Neutral spine is something that has come out in the last 10 or 15 years or so. Everybody is using it. And in actual fact, I don't think it's a good thing in certain cases. So what's going to happen here? We're going to show you the detrimental effects of neutral spine. We've got neutral spine here at the moment, which is that small little arch in the back. Okay? If you take your legs right down on the ground, you'll have neutral spine still. I agree with neutral spine when the body is in this position or when you're standing upright, you've got the arch in your back. Perfect, neutral spine. Now, bend your knees. And I want you to take your legs vertically into the air. OK, do you notice how you're having to really pull the legs up to try and keep the legs there? OK, and look, the legs aren't even vertical. They added a little bit of an angle here. So it's a bit of a struggle on your hip flexors. And notice the stomach's also trying to pop out a little bit because you're actually straining muscles there. OK, the arch, however, has gone. So your neutral spine has gone from an arch and just squashed down without anything else moving or shifting around. So in actual fact, you're doing this with your spine. OK, relax again. Bend the knees. So imagine this. Imagine the Sydney Harbour Bridge superimposed into the arch of your lower back. You've got one pylon, which is your hip, the other pylon, which is your rib cage. That arch will be there when you are in this position here or in legs straight down on the ground. But when the legs are in the air, that arch has disappeared. But those pylons have not moved. So consequently, what is happening to your back is this. It's compacting on itself. So therefore, you're going to get a strain in the back. You're going to strain your hip flexors. Not great for the exercising. Also, because you're compacting your lower back muscles and you're squeezing them tight, there are muscles that attach from the base of your spine to the base of your skull. If you squeeze these muscles here and then you try and curl forward, you're going to strain your neck. So let's take your legs back up again. The back is now flat. Hip flexors are straining because we're not getting legs straight. Now try curling forward. OK, hands mid thigh level. Just stay there. Don't grab your legs. Just fingers forward. OK, notice how much elevation there is here. Notice how much abdominal connection there is. So just move that hand out there. Notice how much the abs are up or down. OK, hand back forward again. And also, how much neck strain you're getting after maybe even five seconds. OK, because these muscles are being pulled down this way. OK, relax back down again. So what we're going to do here is what we call the offering. We've taken the name The Offering from an exercise on the Reformer called The Offering, where you've got your hands in the straps and you're extending your arms forward like this. It's called The Offering. So I need you to roll your backside up into the air, grab your butt, roll your spine down one bone at a time. So you're imprinting your spine down onto the floor and lengthening it out away from you when you get towards your backside. So you're offering your butt to your heels. That's how we got the name Offering. So now there should be no arch in the back at all. OK, so let's go back to that test exercise. So bend the knees up, take the legs vertically into the air. Notice where the legs are now. They're not over here like they were initially. They're automatically here. Curl forward again, 
reaching mid-thigh level. Again, notice the elevation. The elevation is better. And also, the neck doesn't look like it's pulled back there. It actually looks more comfortable. How does that feel? Good. Okay, if we move that arm out of the way just there for a second, the abs also look, don't look like they're poking out either. They look actually flatter than they were before. Okay? And relax back down again. So the offering is a huge, huge, huge thing that must be done in a lot of exercises which involve contraction. Otherwise, you will strain your neck and your back. The other major thing that we've got now, which we're working on abdominal strength and abdominal core, is a thing called the blast breath. Earlier, we talked about ocean breath. And ocean breath was in through the nose for a five count and a loud sigh out of the mouth for a five count without holding your breath and without blowing. If you blow, you can actually see the strain in the neck muscles here. Okay? Certain exercise programs do blow, but here it's... So actually just let your jaw drop and let the air come out. So you can squeeze and use your abdominal muscle to do that. So get all the air out of your lungs. Like Pilates said, it's like wringing water out of a towel. Get every last atom of air out of your lungs. Okay? So what we're going to do here with a blast breath is we're going to do um, an exercise which actually connects your abdominals, which is very, very important to help you work the rest of the abdominals. Um, Cara, just curl forward again with hands at mid-thigh level, just ribs to hips there. Again, notice how much elevation there is here. And now go down onto your side, lie on your side, facing the front. We've created this exercise called lateral core control, which basically is to control the lateral core muscles here. Straighten your legs, bring them around at a 45 degree angle. Your hand is on there, that's it. The hand underneath the head is palm up, so you don't push palm down, so you don't cheat by pushing down. A little bit of a tuck, okay? Feet flexed, one on top of the other, that's it. And you're going to lift the legs into the air with a blast breath. Now, the definition of a blast breath is all the air out of your lungs in less than a quarter second. Okay? It goes like this. And then slow breath in. Have you ever had a coughing or a laughing fit and your abs kill you? Notice the action of that cough or the laugh. It connects these muscles here very, very firmly, and it's these side ones, and they kill like anything. So blast breath is actually very, very good for your transverse abdominal muscles. Laughing is fantastic for your core. So take a breath in, keep the shoulder blade relaxed here, and a blast breath out. Good. And touch and lift. You're going to do it about, oh, we'll do 10 of these. Try, if you can, not to rest the legs so you can feel that the arm isn't relaxing either. But there's a bit of cheating going on here because there's a push on the arm. That's fine. Don't worry about it. It still works these muscles. And if you put your fingers in there, you'll actually feel them working quite a lot. We're going to try and stabilize here more by holding that position there so you're not rolling back too much. We don't mind, and relax, and let's change sides. We don't mind if you cheat a little bit. It is much better to get the muscle working, to get the movement going, without any you know, discomfort or pain, because you're actually still working the muscle. Trying to get it specifically done from the very, very first repetition just doesn't make sense. So get the body moving, get it working, because as you get the muscles connected, we'll then define them so that we can then make them work more specific later. Okay, lengthen out. Take a breath in, and a blast. Now, the legs are at a 45 degree angle forward. And I'll notice, show the difference in a second as to why we want it at 45 degrees. And it's much tougher. Most people won't even be able to lift their legs here. Two more. Use the blast breath. That's it. And relax. OK. Lying on your back again with your head up over here, where we were originally. And do the offering. OK. And again, just curl forward with the hands at mid-thigh level. Okay. Again, if you notice the difference here, there's more height in here and less neck strain. But coming back to the abs, how do your abs feel now connecting compared to before? Better, stronger. Better, stronger. Is there more area connecting? Yeah. Okay. So now you're actually going to feel sides here as well connecting. Not just your rectus abdominis, which is that six-pack that you're trying to do this all the time, because these don't work. If these work... They also work in forward flexion, and they will help you with this. So if you start straining from your rectus abdominis, it will give way, and you'll start straining your neck, or you'll strain your back. But if these are supporting you, you can stay up for a lot longer. Another very important point when it comes to abdominal connection is the psoas muscle. Um, just to keep it very, very brief, your psoas muscle is a muscle that attaches from the lower lumbar vertebra, comes across the pelvis, and attaches to the top of your femur or your thigh bone on the inside, the medial side of your femur. The action of that muscle is a hip flexor. 
Basically, it flexes the bones from the hip, so it'll assist in lifting the leg up when you're standing or sitting. It also assists in, once you've done a small stomach crunch and your six pack, your rectus abdominis has done the work, it lifts you into an upright sitting position. So that small muscle in the back can actually do an enormous amount of work. If your abdominals are weak, it becomes very, very strong and it arches your back a lot more. So one way that we have discovered to try and stretch this muscle is actually with a new position that we have in all our programs called Menezes position. Now, this is what this involves, and we're going to show you this from a point of view of how the effect is on your back. So what I'd like you to do is you've done the offering already, Kara, so you can draw your knees up to your chest, take your legs up into the air. We're not going to strain your neck here at all, so we're just going to keep your head down on the ground, palms are up. Keep your legs as straight as you comfortably can. Your back is still flat. Okay, in this position here, if we draw a line from the navel to the spine, That'll hit it, like we mentioned before, your L2, L3 vertebra. Imagine there's a coin under there. We call that the lumbar coin. Okay, that coin is now flat. Underneath the sacrum, or near your tailbone, just above your tailbone, there's a, a bone there called the sacrum. In the center of that, there is another coin called your sacral coin. When both coins are down, we call that stable spine compared to neutral spine. So when you've got stable spine, your tailbone, sacral area is down, and your lumbar area is down. So there's nothing tilting anywhere. So what we're going to do is you're going to keep your lumbar coin down and lower the legs to where you feel your back is, where that lumbar coin is just about to lift. Okay, so this is the angle here. Watch the angle here. And also, if you notice, this is starting to pop up over here. So let's go back up here to the center again. So this time we're going to go into Menezes position. We're going to try and stretch that psoas. The psoas will stretch by turning the femur inwards. So internal rotation of the femur like that. So the toes come together. Sometimes you might find that this is going to strain a lot of people on the muscles here. It just takes getting used to, but it does strain quite a bit there. So we've now got the knees turned in. We've got the feet turned in. The heels are open. And now lower the legs to where your lumbar coin stays down. Okay. Notice the lumbar coin is flatter. This is not poking up. Look at the height of the legs. Much, much lower. And then come back up again. Okay, so you can see from here that by internally rotating the femur, just keep your hands out by your sides there for a second. So get into Menezes position again, flex your feet, pull the toes back, good. The knees are open here as well, okay. So keep the lumbar coin down because we can see the shot in the side view here and lower the legs to where the lumbar coin stays flat, okay. Okay, so there's no arch in the back there. Okay, hold that position. Now bring your feet back together again, heels together. And notice how... Your back wants to really, really strain and struggle to come back up there, and this is popping up, and you can't hold it there for long. Okay? So on most of the exercises that involve the legs in the air, you've got Menezes position where the toes are together, the knees are open. There are other exercises here, for example, if you're doing stomach crunches. Feet are on the ground. Make sure there's a right angle at the knee joint, so the feet have to go a bit further away. Keep the knees together and open the feet wide and flex the feet. So again, you're internally rotating the femur, the abs are going to go a lot flatter because the psoas isn't pulling up to try and connect because it's being stretched. So therefore, you're going to work your abdominals for strength, not just to try and keep the psoas down as well. Okay? So now you get much, much stronger abs in a shorter space of time by using this position here. Now, the next thing we're going to do is talk about where the hand position is behind the head. So if you can sit up for a second with your back to the camera. In this position here, when a lot of people have their hands behind the head, they'll have them here on their temples or behind their ears. Just do that for a second, Karen. Okay, so notice if you're doing stomach crunches, for example, and your hands are here by your ears, which is what most people do, notice the angle of the humerus here. It's almost at a right angle to the torso here. The muscle that connects from the humerus to your torso here is called your latissimus dorsi, or your lats, or that V-shaped bodybuilders get. Okay, its function is to actually stabilize your shoulder. So if you squeeze your shoulder blades down, it connects over here. And you can feel that. If you do it, you can feel that connection there if you bring your arm down. Um, if you're doing a lat pull down, for example, that's why it's called a lat pull down. But if you connect this muscle here, when you're contracting or curling forward, the function of this muscle, once you've curled past this certain point here, is to actually, when it connects, is to pull you down. So it brings you back to the floor. So you can't do your stomach crunches correctly. You've got to get this lat out of the way as much as possible in order for you to curl the upper part of your back. So, standing upright. We've got what we call here the top position. So you're going to put your, interlock your thumbs and your fingers. So your thumbs are just touching each other, okay? And never, ever, ever put your thumbs on your neck. So thumbs down here like this. Never do that when you're doing stomach crunches because whatever you touch works. You will strain your neck if your thumbs are there. So get your thumbs up to here. And in the base of your skull, lift your hands up just higher. In the base of your skull, right up here, 
where the skull dips in, and you'll feel that if you put your finger there, put your thumbs into that spot there, okay? Notice how high the thumbs are. They're not going to strain the neck. They're not going to touch the neck. That little dip in the skull is called your occiput. This position here, where it's thumbs on occiput, we call top position. Capital T, capital O, capital P. Thumbs on occiput. Not exactly the letters, but it works. So whenever you've got your hands behind your head, always have this position here. The other major, major point that we've instigated now is whenever you're doing stomach crunches, don't pull on your head. Press your head into your hands 5% and let the abs do the work to curl forward. So let's get you back onto your back again. Doing the offering. 90 degree angle at the knee joint. Knees together, feet wide open, feet flexed. Hands in top position. Take a breath in. Elbows a little bit wider and an ocean breath out to bring your ribs to your hips. Good, keeping your eyes up here, chin up here. Keep going. When you go back, don't go all the way back as well, so you want to keep the muscle continuously working. If you take a rest with your head touching the cushion, you're going one, 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 not 10 continual actions, so you're resting in between each repetition. Keep the abs scooped in, and going back too far. Just to there, that's enough, and forward. Now, keep the elbows wider, press your head into your hands 5%. That's it, so keep the head pressed into the hands. Can you feel the abs connecting a bit more then? By pressing the head back that way, you're actually working your abs harder. You're also working them harder because of the position of your legs here. So a couple of major points happening here to work your abs and notice how flat they are. Okay, if you bring your feet together, okay, and now just pull on your neck when you come forward, notice how it pops up as well. Straight away you can see it popping up the center here and relax and you will strain your neck. Okay, now we're going to go over some breathing techniques as well. So, we've got five different breathing rules, and they're very, very specific um, when it comes to specific exercises. They cover the majority of exercises in Pilates, Manesis, Pilates, or even in the gym. So, when your arms are vertically in the air, this is rule number 1A. When your arms are vertically in the air, palms are facing in. When your arms go overhead, breathe out. So, and flatten the rib cage. So, breathing out, flatten the rib cage. So, you're trying to keep that lumbar coin down as well. When you lift, lift from the triceps breathing in. And coming up, breathing in. Okay, so whenever you're using a long lever, the principle here is never lift from the distal part of the lever because you will strain the joint. Work from the proximal muscle by the, lead, by the joint and that will work that muscle there. So when you release, breathe out to let go, flatten the rib cage, good, and then lift from the triceps breathing in. That'll stabilize your shoulder. So it's a breath out to go over and a breath in to come up. Now, let's try the reverse. Breathe in, huge deep breath in when you go over. And notice the back wants to arch. You can see the rib cage popping out and the back is definitely arched more. So you're not stabilizing your back at all if you do that breathing where you breathe in to go over, which is what most people want to do. The same with the legs here. So when the legs or the arms move from the vertical away from your center, breathe out. So rule number 1A, when the arms and the legs Move from the vertical, away from the center, breathe out. Breathing rule 1B. So, Kara, can you take your arms up into the air, vertical, just above the chest here. And 1B is when your arms or your legs move laterally away from the median, which is the line straight down your middle, called the median, M-E-D-I-A-N, you breathe in. So breathe in to open and out to close. And again, and remember, you're working the muscle proximal to the rotating joint. So squeezing from your bicep, forgetting about the hand. Even if you have a weight in the hand, forget about it. Just work from the bicep muscle. It'll work the pec muscle better as well. So breathe in to open and also close the rib cage. So the breathing still comes into this. It's ocean breath out. So close the rib cage and that'll also firm up the thoracic area and work the abdominals more. Okay, the next breathing rule. It's a very, very simple rule. Whenever contracting, rotating, or side flexing your torso, breathe out. So if you're contracting into the position here, Kara, just curling forward, that's a breath out. Don't hold your breath. I see so many people doing these exercises, they hold their breath when they go up and down. So breathe in and ocean breath out. Okay, pretty simple. Okay, the next one is sitting upright, part of this. Um, you can notice there is more movement here. And then squeeze the core and breathe in to come up. So whenever you're using that core, it's a breath in to come up from side flexion, squeezing the core. The next breathing rule is on all fours. Okay, so just to recap that last breathing rule, 
Whenever rotating, contracting, or side flexing the torso, breathe out. Now, the breathing rule for here is any movement away from your center or median, breathe in. So when on all fours, any movement away from the center or median, breathe in. And that should be also when you're lying on your side as well. So what you would want to do here is say, for example, Kara's taking the opposite arm and opposite leg. Just notice this for a second. What I'd like you to do is you're going to do opposite arm and opposite leg, but breathe out, which is what most people want to do, is a breath out. So deep breath out to extend the arm and leg. Okay, and watch this area here. Kara doesn't know which area I'm talking about. Breathe in to come back down. And again, other side, breathing out. Okay, notice the area. Come back down again. Okay, this time, take a breath in. Don't hold the position, don't move. Take a breath out. No, don't move, don't move, don't move. Take a breath out. Now breathe in and extend the opposite arm and leg. And notice the difference here. And again, change. Breathe out to go down. In. Again, notice the area. Much, much, much more stable. And back down again. Okay? So you can feel by breathing in, we didn't even say strengthen your core, work your core, pull your beeline in. You automatically, by the intra-abdominal pressure, support that area so you actually feel like there's less back strain. Okay? Okay, the next breathing rule, the last breathing rule, is when lying on your side or prone, anything you lift, breathe out except when prone and lifting your torso, breathe in. So, let's try that. Lying on your side, arm out underneath the head, palm up, legs straight out in front of you. Sorry, in that angle there, good. And all you're going to do here is lift your legs. And you'll breathe out to do that if you were breathing. <laughs> Take a breath in and breathe out to lift. Good, just a long breath, ocean breath out. Good, and keeping your hips stacked as much as you can. There you go. Good, now try breathing in. It's really difficult, okay? So it's a breath out to lift. If you're on your side and lifting your torso, say for, say for example, I took Kara's hand and I was going to lift her up this way, breathe out, okay? And again, right, try that breathing in. It's not easy, and down, and you probably don't feel very comfortable doing that. So whenever you're lying on your side or prone, so let's go onto your stomach. So if you're going to lift and say in this position here, what they call swimming, but a slow swim, lifting the opposite arm and opposite leg. So rest your head down. Okay, extend your arms forward. Good. So opposite arm, opposite leg, breathing out. Not too high, because you don't want to impact the back too much. Breathe in to lower and change. And slowly down so there's no banging. Keep your beeline up off the floor here to support the back. So it's a breath out to lift, in to lower. However, there was an exception to this rule, which is Bring your hands down to your ear level. Good. And now, when you're coming up, again, a lot of people breathe out on this movement. So you're going to come up into a, a swan. So breathing in to come up and out to go down. OK. Now, we're going to try and do this the reverse. Most people want to breathe out to do this because they think it's an out in the effort. So breathe out to come up, Kara. And just notice this area here and look at the shape of it. Oh, down you go again. This time you're going to take a breath in to come up. Okay, and you notice this is not so compacted as it was before. Okay, and relax down. So, recapping that rule, whenever you're lying on your side or prone, which is on your stomach, anything you lift, breathe out, except when prone and lifting your torso, you breathe in.